Hello, my name is Trisha, and in this video, I will discuss organic photovoltaics, or OPV. To begin our discussion, I would like to start with the motivation for photovoltaics, or solar cells, in general. Photovoltaics convert solar energy, or light, into electrical energy. Solar energy has many advantages over current energy sources. Unlike coal, oil, and natural gas, it is extremely abundant, renewable, and non-polluting. OPV cells are a type of photovoltaic that use organic materials instead of traditional semiconductors. Organic materials are materials with carbon, while semiconductors are group 3, 4, and 5 elements. Organic cells have numerous benefits. They have the potential to be very cheap for two main reasons. The raw materials are abundant and the production of OPV cells is less energy intensive and less costly than their inorganic counterparts. This is because OPV can be made via cheaper processes than inorganic cells. Furthermore, organic cells have a wide spectrum of applications. These cells can be produced on flexible, clear, or colored substrates, which makes them useful for integration with buildings and gives them a variety of uses. OPV competes with established photovoltaic technologies like mono and polycrystalline, thick film, and amorphous silicon cells and other emerging technologies like thin film, quantum dot, and gallium arsenide solar cells. So how do they compare? As I mentioned earlier, OPV is cheaper and has broader applications than most of these technologies. Furthermore, organic cells have high absorption coefficients. However, there are some drawbacks. Organic cells generally have higher optical band gaps than silicon cells, around 2 electron volts instead of 1.1. These higher band gaps limit the amount of light that these cells can harvest from the solar spectrum because only photons with high enough energy can be absorbed. OPV cells are also less durable than traditional cells because they are generally thinner and degrade more easily. Also, because organic cells have small exciton diffusion lengths and low carrier mobilities, these cells usually have efficiencies that are much lower than their counterparts. As you can see, OPV have efficiencies near 11%, while other technologies have efficiencies between 20 and 40%. The main difference between the types of cells is that OPV does not make use of semiconductor p-n junctions. Rather, organic cells have a heterojunction with an electron donating and an electron accepting material sandwiched between two electrodes. Because these materials aren't crystalline, they don't have a conduction and a valence band, and carriers move by hopping between localized states. This is why carrier mobilities are low compared to inorganic semiconductors, and OPV cells have to be thin, which renders them less durable. Organic cells absorb light in a similar manner to inorganic ones. A photon is absorbed by the electron donating material, promoting a valence electron to a conduction exciton. If the exciton is close enough to the donor acceptor interface, then the exciton will encounter an electric field which will cause the electron to move into the acceptor and the hole to move into the donor. Each carrier will drift until it reaches its respective electrode, creating a current and producing a voltage. There are a few additional components that organic cells have. OPVs generally have a transparent electrode rather than a grid-like one to allow light into the active layer. Also, organic cells generally have buffer layers between the active layer and electrodes to promote charge collection and extraction. There are three types of organic cells. In small molecule-based cells, the donating material is a highly conjugated system. That is, it is a molecule with alternating single and multiple bonds, like this one over here. The acceptor can be a dye or a fullerene, like this. Polymer-based cells have long-chain molecules as the donor and derivatives of fullerenes as the acceptor. Disensitized cells use dyes as the donor and metal oxides as the accepting material in an electrolyte to replenish electrons. There are two main types of organic cell structure, the simple bilayer and the bulk heterojunction. In the bilayer, there's a distinct donor layer and acceptor layer. While in the bulk or dispersed heterojunction, the two materials are interspersed with each other. Bulk heterojunction cells are much more efficient than simple bilayers. 
This occurs mostly because of the increased area of the donor acceptor interface. Since exitons created only a diffusion length from, away from the interface have a chance of creating carriers, the more interface area results in more photons being converted into current. Since the diffusion lengths of these organic materials are around 10 nanometers, the size scale of the interspersion must be around 10 and 20 nanometers to see this increased efficiency. Evaporation and wet processing are the two most common techniques for organic thin film production. Evaporation requires the organic substance to withstand high temperatures, while wet processing requires the substance to be soluble. Since polymers generally decompose under high temperatures and are soluble, and small molecules can withstand high temperatures but are less soluble, evaporation is generally used for small molecules and solution processing for polymers. To generate a film by evaporation, the target material is vaporized in a vacuum chamber and is then redeposited on the substrate. The vacuum is strong enough that the mean free path of the target substance is larger than the distance between the source and the substrate. In wet processing, the target material is dissolved in an appropriate solvent, which can be a polar or nonpolar organic solvent or water. Then a variety of techniques can be used to deposit the material on a substrate, like spin coating, screen printing, and inkjet printing. Most of the history behind organic photovoltaics, and indeed photovoltaics in general, lies in the 20th century, but most of the physics behind solar cells was established in the 19th century. Becquerel is generally attributed with the discovery of the photovoltaic effect in 1836. This is the effect in which certain materials develop a current under illumination from light. In the 1870s, the first reports of photoconductivity were made. This is the phenomenon in which certain materials become more conductive under illumination. In the early 20th century, photoconductivity was first observed in an organic molecule, anthracene, but it wasn't until the 50s and 60s that organic materials were identified as potential photoreceptors, marking them as candidates for converting light into signals. In the 60s, it was discovered that many common dyes had semiconducting properties. The first inorganic cell was made in 1954 by Bell Laboratories. It was a silicon cell with 6% efficiency. In the 80s, polymers began to be investigated in solar cells. Up until this point, organic solar cells were based on a single organic layer, usually a dye sandwiched between two electrodes. Their efficiencies were extremely low, ranging between a thousandth to a hundredth of a percent, with one dye reaching 0.7%. However, this all changed with the discovery of the heterojunction by Tang in 1986. He combined two organic layers, one acting as a p-type and another acting as an n-type into a heterojunction cell. This first cell reported a 1% efficiency. However, however, heterojunction cells became more efficient with the introduction of bulk heterojunction and efficiencies near 2%. In the early 2000s, OPV efficiencies were around 3% and currently they are around 11%. Organic solar cells face many challenges. The biggest problem is the issue of robustness. Organic cells are susceptible to a host of factors that limit their stability, including water, oxygen, irradiation, mechanical stress, heating, metastable morphology, and electrodiffusion. Water and oxygen can diffuse into cells and change the chemistry of the donors, acceptors, and electrodes. Irradiation can decompose certain organic compounds over time while mechanical stress can fracture layers. Heating can degrade the active layer and the interfaces between the active layers and electrodes. Because OPVs are made of multiple amorphous materials, separation between the donors and the acceptors can become unstable and ambiguous over time. Likewise, the electrodes and buffer can diffuse into the organic active layer. All of these factors contribute to the organic cells having much smaller lifetimes than silicon and other semiconductor cells. Organic cells also have to improve in efficiency, since they are currently only around 11% efficient and commercial solar cells are double to triple that, they have a long way to go. Once these technological hurdles are solved, then organic cells will have to take on the challenge of market adoption. Currently only 1% of the world's energy demand is supplied by solar energy. 
over three quarters of energy is still supplied by fossil fuels, while the dominant renewable is hydropower. Even though solar energy is virtually everywhere, there are a host of factors that impede market adoption. Solar generated electricity is still more expensive than fossil fuel generated ones, and thus can only thrive with the help of government subsidies and policy. Secondly, climate renders certain regions more suited for solar energy than others, which naturally prevents universal adoption. Finally, solar currently requires lots of land because efficiencies are not very high and current solar cells are not very integratable with existing infrastructure. With more development, hopefully organic solar cells will be able to address and rectify these concerns. Thank you for listening.